Welcome to the Governor's Talk Series for 2022 annual meetings. I have the pleasure today to welcome Leonardo Villar, Governor of Colombia Central Bank, Banco de la República, to talk about the challenges central banks in the region are facing in a context of elevated inflationary pressures. And what's coming? A tightening of global financial conditions. Leonardo has been the governor of the Banco de la República since January 2021. He, was, he has vast experience as a public servant, serving as a technical deputy minister at the Ministry of Finance between 94 and 97, and board member of the Central Bank from 97 to 2009, and he also knows the fund. Well, he served as IMF ED, Executive Director, between 2018 and 2020. Leonardo, it's a pleasure to have you here today uh, with us. Please. Thank you, Ilan. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Leonardo. So uh, we have uh, just uh, half an hour for everything, and we need uh, to to get some of questions that uh, I'm sure interest all of you. So let me get jump right to the uh, questions. Start with the stance of monetary policy. We had the pandemic. We had the war or the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Now, I think the region and the world will face tightening financial conditions that for emerging markets, and I think for Colombia, is also a third shock, which means tighter interest rates, tighter conditions, less financing. How do you see, going forward, this inflationary risk that we mentioned and the trade of monetary policy in this environment that is about to get uh, tougher? Well, Ilan, what you have mentioned, several of the shocks that we have faced, all of us, in all the countries. But in addition to those shocks, in addition to, to, the, to the shocks that we have come to Colombia from outside, we have had uh, at least two additional elements that are key to define our monetary policy stance. Uh, one is the fact that food prices have gone up by much more than uh, in other countries. Uh, we have uh, made an analysis trying to, to see what has happened with food prices. And after May 2021, uh, um, the, the, the food prices have gone up by more or less 7% above the level of our peers. So we have had an additional uh, supply shock in, the, in, in, in terms of, uh, of food prices. Uh, they are growing today at 27%. This is a huge number. And the second element of Colombia is that we are experiencing a surprise in terms of, uh, of growth. Uh, demand growth is huge. Uh, we have been we have been uh, updating the, the 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 growth prospect for this year. I know that you too have been uh, uh, revising the the number. Uh, we at the at the central bank we are uh, expecting a GDP growth to be 7.8 percent, which is a, a very high number, especially if you take in, in mind that uh, in 2021. We grew by 10.6 percent. The, the 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 rate of growth of GDP this year will be one of the highest in the world, and that uh, reflects an even higher number in terms of growth in in aggregate demand. So that uh, poses a huge challenge. Uh, this is uh, good in the sense that we have good growth. That the per capita income is, is growing this year. But in order to make it sustainable and to, to have a sustainable economy, we have to, 
to tighten monetary policy, and we have been doing so. Uh, interest rate uh, just one year ago was 1.75%, and today it is 10%. And um, the, the, the signal that have been provided to markets is that uh, we are not necessarily over in, the, in terms of, uh, of adjusting monetary policy. Uh, market expectations imply that uh, perhaps the, 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 the peak, according to the markets, will be around 11, 11.5%. So uh, I'm not saying that we will go there. Uh, but uh, but, but, but the, the, what I'm saying is that the, 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 the tightening process is uh, still there. And, um, and the expectations are that we, we will continue tightening. And as you mentioned, it seems necessary because on one hand you have demand pressures, on the other hand you have inflation elevated, and the need uh, to reduce inflation uh, over the long. Now one question uh, I would like to, to ask you uh, are about risks uh, linked to that. Uh, do, do, you, do, you, do you envisage uh, what uh, what will you be your trade-offs if inflation uh, end up being more persistent than we we are thinking? And we are we are thinking about this question not only for Colombia but we're thinking the question for the U.S. We're thinking about the question: What if inflation, for some reason, is more persistent than we expected? What will be uh, the consequences? What do we need to be aware? Well, one of the characteristics of Colombia is that we had, for a very long time, during the last, uh, I would say, three decades of the last century, inflation uh, not so high uh, levels as other countries in the, in the region, but very high levels. I mean, uh, they, they, we had inflation between 20 and 30 percent. And that implied that we had uh, that we created indexation mechanisms that are there, and it is very easy to to to, to revive them. Um, so the main risk that I see today is that uh, with deflation above 10 percent, those uh, indexation mechanisms will be reviving, and um, it will be costly to to reduce inflation uh, rapidly. Expectations uh, suggest that the uh, market expectations suggest that uh, inflation will go down in, in, in one year time to something like seven percent, and two years time to something like four point five percent. But even in two year time, four point five percent is well above our target, which is three percent. So that um, that poses a, a, a very difficult <coughs> task of Keeping credibility in the in the in the target, um, and uh, and being able to 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 maintain uh, the inflation targeting scheme, which requires that credibility. So that is uh, something that we have to take in mind uh, when we adjust the interest rate. We are trying to do so, but of course, will be a difficult task. Uh, since we know that uh, the process will take, uh, the process of converging to the, uh, to the target will take perhaps more than two years. Yeah, it takes, uh, uh, when you have this such uh, large shocks, uh, pandemic, and the Russian invasion, uh, and the supply shock you mentioned specifically, idiosyncratic, uh, it, it generates uh, challenges, and uh, you, even if it takes two years to go back, it's important that the expectations are there they go back. So you, we measure the credibility of central banks when their medium-term, long-term expectations are anchored in the target of the central bank. And that's why it probably is the reason why uh, central banks in Western M, in Latin America, uh, acted uh, first. It uh, seems, when you look at the other regions and other major markets, that central banks 
uh, in Latin America were ahead of the rest, uh, front-loaded a little bit, and started raising rates before. And uh, the question uh, for us usually is, why do you think they did it before? And I think your answer is important because it says, we have in Latin America an history of inflation, of indexation, of mechanisms, that if you allow things to go even higher, and it takes even longer, and your endpoint deviates from your target, then the probability of getting into this. But let me ask you, do you agree with this, or do you think uh, there were other factors that made uh, your central bank or other central banks to tighten first? Well, I think there are, I would mention two, two reasons. Why? Right? One is we know inflation. We know the cost of inflation. So uh, when we saw inflation going up, it was very important for us to, 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 to avoid the situation in which we were 25 years ago. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that's a key reason for that. The second one was that the, the recovery was much uh, more rapid than, than we were expecting. The, the, in the, by mid-2021, we were expecting that uh, the recovery would take time, that uh, perhaps we will recover the level of production, of the pre-pandemic level of production in 2022. And suddenly we realized that we were already there. That we were that in the third quarter of 2021 we were already with the production above um, pre-pandemic levels. So, so that and, and that uh, uh, inflationary pressures were uh, uh, were also present. So, it was time to 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 start a process for, of normalization. At that time, it was normalization of monetary policy. But after that. We had all those surprises that you mentioned uh, internationally and the surprises that came from inside the country, which uh, implied that the, the process of adjustment had to be much more rapid than, than previously expected. One way to that monetary policy can act uh, uh, stronger is uh, good communication. Uh, because when you start uh, the process of normalization or tightening, uh, if markets anticipate that they, you will still need to tighten up to a certain point and they believe it, that immediately is reflected in long-term interest rates, minimum, and that start to act. So the communication is very important. You, when you were answering the first question, you said market expects, uh, and you said also, I'm not saying we're going there, but uh, that's what the market expects. But in some sense, communication uh, of the central bank is to guide this type of... Uh, so so how, how are you using these instruments now in this moment uh, of, of the need of this inflation? Well, this is the beginning. In September 2021, we, we said that we were just starting a process. That would be a process, a, a long-term process, of adjusting monetary policy. It was not a decision for one time, but it was uh, something that we will be doing through time. And that uh, implied that the uh, expectations were that the interest rate would go up uh, in an important and permanent way uh, for, 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 for a um, relatively long period. That has implied that um, um, interest rates in the market have gone up uh, by more than what we have done. I mean, if you look at the long-term interest rates, or uh, not, not so much the long, long, long term, but the medium term. The, the, uh, I mean, uh, market rates for one year, two years, have gone up by more than, um, than the policy rate. And I think that is the product of, of that type of communication. We have been very cautious in avoiding um, forward guidance in the sense that we, we, we don't want to say we will be there or here, and, and in saying we, we will use all the information available at each point 
in which we have to take decisions. But the, the direction of the policy has been very clear since the beginning. And I think that is uh, 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 an important part of uh, the communication of the bank. Yeah, the direction and uh, where do you want to go? Is, because that was what ended up being embedded uh, in, the, in the rate. Um, let's, let's move a little bit from only monetary policy because we know central banks live in a more complex environment with other type of institutions, with fiscal. And we know that uh, uh, it is uh, an important, and there was, uh, it was today a seminar talking about uh, how can you address all the social needs uh, in a tight budget. Uh, so, in terms of uh, uh, monetary policy, is how do how do you see fiscal policy in the case of Colombia uh, helping uh, monetary policy in, in 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 the main challenge today, which is monetary, which is inflationary risks? Uh, is 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 fiscal policy have been complementary? Uh, what are they? Uh, what are the trade-offs there? Well, I, I would say that so far, if fiscal policy has been uh, expansionary. Uh, if you look at the fiscal deficit, um, it stayed very high in 2021, uh, while most countries in the region were reducing yes. the fiscal deficit because of the increase in uh, in growth. With the very high growth, revenues, government revenues, became much higher, and the fiscal deficit shrinked, and that didn't happen in Colombia. The the fiscal deficit stayed very large, and uh, this year it is been reduced uh, a bit in the sense that uh, it's not a uh, eight percent as last year and in 2020, but it will be like a 5.6% is the projection, uh, which um, with this type of growth that we are experiencing, uh, this type of, this level of economic activity, uh, the deficit should be uh, reduced by much more. But looking forward, the expectation is that the, with the tax reform that is in process, uh, the um, the government will reduce the fiscal deficit by more or less two percentage points uh, from this year to the, to the next. Uh, in a year in which uh, growth will not be as high. So in that sense, fiscal policy will be acting in the same, in the same direction as uh, monetary policy is acting. Yes, because we, uh, the they need to act uh, together, and uh, if you, if you all have seen, uh, the main messages of these annual meetings is that there is a call for fiscal policy to contribute to monetary policy, at least not go in the other direction of being fiscal expansionary, and uh, the reason uh, of of using both instruments is that it is, it makes. Uh, the uh, the impact of monetary policy more better. You can you don't need to raise interest rates so much, which we know the consequence of rising interest rates is not. Uh, and, uh, there are of course impact of that, but if fiscal policy contributes at the same time, maybe earlier, not later, it also helps uh, at the beginning. And the risks, and that's what I think I want you to comment. The risk is that. If you don't have both instruments working together, uh, at some point you will need to do more. Mm -hmm. And then the risk is that the deceleration that comes later could be less smooth than we would like to. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I just agree. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So it is better when it comes from my, from my side. No? <laughs> so on. I have, I, I'm gonna open for questions from you. Just let me ask one more question, and then we can go uh, to you. So think about the questions that you want to do. Raise your hand, and I'm gonna 
call you for that. Last, uh, last question is about monetary policy is not only about uh, interest rates. Uh, monetary policy defined central bank uh, policies. Sorry, central bank policies are not only about monetary policy interest rates. There are other instruments, and this institution, the IMF, has been working on uh, when to use other instruments, when can you don't uh, use, for example, when is appropriate to do capital flow management, when, when is appropriate to have foreign exchange intervention. And it is a, always a very delicate subject in the sense that you don't want to undermine the fundamentals, which is monetary policy, fiscal policy, but you want to see when there is a role to complement. So in the case of Colombia or in the case of the Banco de la República, how, how do you think that this type of instruments and this type of discussion that the, the, the IMF is having uh, fits? Well, I have very clear that this is not a moment in which uh, CFMs uh, will work in, uh, in a country like Colombia. Um, we have some measures that, for instance, reduce the mismatch of the banks, which is something very important. Uh, but I, if they, if, if those measures to, 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 to control the mismatch in, 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 the, in the banking sector are considered CFMs. Um, Sometimes well, they're macroprudential. The, uh, uh, but if they are called macroprudential, I like that. Macroprudential, <laughs> we are using that for a very long time. But um, the other types of uh, uh, capital flow management, uh, I don't think will be reasonable in the current situation in Colombia. Um, this Colombia is benefiting from uh, capital inflows. Uh, the, the markets are helping to finance the fiscal deficit. The, 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 the most uh, of the um, current account deficit that we have is financed by FDI, but also portfolio flows are flowing in and they help con Colombia. So it will be counterproductive to say that we would uh, lock them in Colombia. So, so, so I think that, that is not uh, under consideration. Uh, the central bank is the one who manages uh, this type of instruments. We are not thinking at all in this type of, of measures. Now about uh, exchange rate intervention, we feel that we cannot say that we will never intervene in the market, <laughs> but um, but we uh, feel very comfortable allowing the market to act as, the, as a first, first uh, line of defense uh, uh, against shocks. Um, we are not considering inter intervention at the current time. Uh, we consider that we will do that if the markets are not working well, but uh, there are no reasons to think that they are not working well. And we clearly are not thinking that we can manage this exchange rate level with uh, uh, FX interventions. Just for the record, we agree with you <laughs> in general, <laughs> in the sense that uh, uh, capital flow managements are not to lock in uh, investors. They are more in the way in when you, if you believe that they, for some reason they're excessive, uh, so that that will be thought about it. And of course, foreign exchange intervention cannot uh, replace uh, the floating exchange. This is the first line of defense and needs to be there unless you have special circumstances that uh, threatens financial stability or something that's not working. And we can talk about what's not working, but uh, what we have been saying is that exchange rate needs to do the work. And especially in moments that we are together, which is capital uh, a, a tightening of financial conditions. That's where you really need to have the buffers and the defense. And I think the exchange rate floating is one, is one of them. So questions from the public. Raise your hand. No, here in the beginning, and then we have somebody uh, in the back. We need you with microphone because this needs to go to the 
online. Was this just getting low? Do you have an estimate for the inflationary impact uh, that the latest drop in the peso against the dollar will have in Colombia? Is that something you're concerned about? Well, we have estimates about the pass-through, uh, which were made in the past. <laughs> which, uh, and the pass-through in general is not so high in Colombia. So it was like 6%. And, but the, the, the problem is that if you have a whole environment of uh, prices going up and uh, depreciation also uh, taking place, the pass-through may become a mechanism of indexation, uh, an additional mechanism that uh, helps to, to, to make indexation stronger. So in that sense, it is very clear that the um, depreciation is something to, to worry about, but uh, it is also very clear that it's something that is not easy to control with the effects interventions or so, something like that. So if we have more depreciation, we may have, uh, we may be forced to tighten uh, more uh, monetary policy because at the end, uh, what um, that may be uh, showing is that we have some excess demand in the economy that uh, um, we should avoid uh, in, in the sense that we sh should reduce the current account deficit to, 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 to need less, 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 uh, less financing. Thank you. Um, in light of this threat to um, the credibility of central banks and this call from the institutions for fiscal policy to coordinate with monetary policy, are there plans to reform the composition of Banrep's board so that the finance minister doesn't get a vote on policy decisions? No, there are no plans. The, 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 I don't think that is needed. I personally have felt that uh, in the case of Colombia, uh, where we had inflation so stable during so long time, it was useful to have the Minister of Finance in the board because he could understand in that way the arguments of all the other members of the board. We are seven members. Many, many times um, the, 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 the minister has uh, voted with the others, but many, many times as well, they, he has, or he, well, he has voted uh, uh, against the, the majority. But what has always worked is that uh, he has understood the arguments of the members that are voting and he has become the, 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 the channel through which the government and the president of the republic, whichever is the president, whoever is the president in the now or in the past, uh, he can see what is happening in the board. The board is not something that uh, takes place uh, outside the world and uh, decides uh, a number on the interest rate that the government doesn't understand. The presence of the, of, the, of the minister there is important. He's one vote of seven, and, um, and I think that uh, is working well. I don't think trying to amend the, the, the functioning of the, of the board will be uh, the best idea in a moment like this. Well, last but not, well, I was going to ask a question, but I'll give, uh, uh, I'll give the public the last one then. Last Hi. question. Um, so Colombia obviously has a very large current account deficit, and as you know, um, external financial conditions have deteriorated and domestic political uncertainty in Colombia has increased. And so you rely every year on very large portfolio inflows and FDI inflows. What gives you the confidence that those flows will continue to be there um, and we won't see a, a sudden stop or some sort of balance of payments crisis? Well. 
What I can say today is that this year, which is not an easy year, <laughs> uh, a year with uh, many difficulties, uh, in, 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 in global difficulties, uh, the current account deficit has been fin financed by 96% by FDI. Um, to a large extent, the, 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 the FDI is the uh, reinvestment of profits of foreign companies in Colombia. So it's not easy to, to, to have them uh, flowing out, so just uh, uh, out of the blue. So, so uh, we feel confident about that. If that is complemented with the, the, the financing that the government needs, then we have portfolio flows or we have uh, foreign financing for the government. And that, for instance, last, last year financed the whole uh, uh, fisc uh, uh, current account deficit. So in that sense, we feel comfortable, but we feel that the level of deficit reflects excess demand in the economy. Uh, when we have 6% 6 6 of the GDP as uh, uh, the current account deficit, that is reflecting uh, excess demand. Um, and that um, is an additional reason to tighten monetary policy and to tighten fiscal policy. Um, and the fact is that we are uh, forecasting that the current account deficit will be uh, reduced in a, by s some uh, two percentage points of GDP for next year. Thank you very much for all of you, but especially for the governor being with us. Thank you very much. And good luck in this third shock. You're all together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.